Hello everybody, I'm Gwen Campbell Mendez. Welcome to Gwen's Bookish Ramblings, and today we're on Dr. Doolittle's post office. Um, which, yes, unfortunately the cover is blurry, uh, because I had to get a copy off of Gutenberg because this is just barely out of copyright, having been published originally in 1923, so it's been a hundred years and is now out of copyright. So, basically, um, this is a 1923 edition that was published, uh, that was illustrated, rather, pardon me, by Hugh Lofting. Uh, and I, I liked, I like these simplified, somewhat stylized drawings. I don't know if this is Hugh Lofting being, being stylized because he wants to be, or being stylized because he's not that great an illustrator. Um, but I think whatever he theoretically may have lacked in, in drawing skill, he makes up for in, uh, we'll call it style. Um, you know, you look at this and this is an, it's an interesting eye-catching frontispiece thing. You know, it's a front page illustration and you've got these two squirrels and they're reading something and these side bits here saying that this is written and illustrated by Hugh Lofting and on the other side saying, you know, who the publisher is. Um, it's an interesting, it's an interesting thing. Uh, this is what the cover looks like, except in black and white, because it's a black and white plate. Um, after all, in the 1920s, you were unlikely to have large numbers of color plates. Uh, but anyways, uh, so you can see here, it's, it's stylized, it's line drawings, it's a lot of flat areas, but it's very nicely evocative. I really, really like the way that he's sort of framing the doctor with with these plants that, that are growing. I believe this is an image from uh, the section of the book where he is in, like, mangrove swamps. And so it's, it's a very lovely, evocative, unexpected-looking uh, image, and I really, really do quite like it. Um, this, which is less evocative, but nonetheless an amusing illustration of a particular point in the book. Um, so the book opens with the doctor deciding he's going to head back to Africa for a while, and when he heads back to Africa, the first thing he runs across is a black woman whose husband has been taken by slave runners. Please keep in mind, these books may have been published in the 1920s, but they're set in the 1820s. And so, uh, slave runners are very much still a thing, 1820s. And so, he sets out to get the woman's husband back from the slave runners, and in the process winds up on board a British frigate that is hunting the, those same people, and... There is a scene here in Depicted where uh, a swallow, Speedy the Swallow, has basically um, told the doctor, I will perch myself on top of this cannon and I will tell you where to aim it and when to fire. And that's what he does. And of course, then the doctor fires the, you know, killing blow on the other ship because he has Speedy the Swallow. Um, you know, it's it's an ongoing thing in these books that the Doctor is not a fundamentally remarkable... Well, he's, he's fundamentally remarkable, yes, because he can talk to animals, but more because he is very calm and centered and phlegmatic and very, very English stiff upper lip uh, sort of... He's, he's got a very staid and calm personality, uh, very, very centered in a lot of ways, and... It's, it's sort of the most remarkable thing about him is this quality of being just very, very calm and placid. I, you know, he gets excited at points, but for the most part, he just takes everything in stride and just rolls with it. And all of the incredible things he does, of course, are due to the fact that he talks to animals. You know, he fires this amazing shot from a cannon, but it's not that he fired an amazing shot, it's that Speedy said fire now, and so he, you know, listened to somebody with a better aim than he had. Um, 
you know, he sets up this post office, but the thing about the post office that he sets up that is run by birds is, you know, he wouldn't be able to do any of these amazing things if it weren't for the fact that the birds were so good at organizing once he'd sort of given them a direction to organize in. You know, the Sparrow Cheapside, who is just one of the rudest creatures in the history of ever and is awful and insulting to absolutely everybody. Um, you know, he's he's extremely cockney and very deliberately so. Um, and yeah, he he says some offensive things, but it's very it's it's implied in this book in a lot of ways by Hugh Lofting that Cheapside is saying a bunch of unacceptable stuff. Uh, but what can you do? There are people like this. Um, anyways, so you have these wonderful quality, this wonderful anthropomorphization of the animals, um, but it's, a, it's an anthropomorphization that nonetheless does periodically lean into the fact that these are animals, that, you know, Jip has his his leaning into, you know, considerations of how things smell and the owl is, you know, forever talking about how there's nothing to be afraid of in the dark. But at the same time, you have this lovely civilized breakfast table with, you know, this, with this seabird who's there and just having another piece of toast that he takes out of the toast rack because he is civilized and will take the toast from the toast rack and carry it back to his plate. You know, it's it's this wonderful combination of, of sort of some civilizing things with animals. There is a certain quality of this, there's a bit of this that's slightly reminiscent of, um, and I, slightly, not entirely, not wholly, of, of C.S. Lewis and the talking animals in... Uh, Narnia. The difference, though, is that the talking animals in Narnia are really very much more human. Uh, whereas the animals in Doctor Doolittle are very much animals. They very much have that they have some very very human wants and thoughts and preferences and considerations and beliefs. Uh, especially Cheapside the Sparrow, but Cheapside the Sparrow is, let's be honest, he's a Londoner, and uh, there's a quality of big city life that one suspects would, would in theory, if animals could think as humans do, would lead to an animal having that kind of lean into things, but at the same time, he's still a sparrow, and he still has that and he still has a certain quality of avian perspective. Um, the book, as it continues, the doctor does wind up setting up a post office because what happened was he got to Africa and a local African king had heard about the post from a couple of Englishmen and the Englishman had not fully explained how the post was supposed to work to him and so he had been initially left with the impression that it was, in effect, magic. You put the stamp on the thing, and it magically wings its way from the box. You put it in with the stamp on it to its destination. And it wasn't until they came back and explained it to him that this was, you know, a thing where a person has to take the post out of the box and carry it places, until that, you know, came to pass... Uh, he hadn't quite realized that that was how it worked. Um, but anyhow, so the doctor manages to show up and the post office has still not been working properly and the doctor sort of reorganizes it. And then one of the problems with this small imaginary African nation is that they are a small imaginary African nation and they're not going to have a lot of international reach. And the king, who wants to be able to get international stuff, like bicycles and things that are not manufactured where he is, uh, you know, he wants this foreign mail. Uh, so the doctor agrees to set up mail as carried by birds. 
Uh, I believe this isn't even first proposed by the Doctor. I believe it's first proposed by one of one of his bird friends. Um, but he organizes it along the principles of various birds as they migrate or travel at various points in time, and sets up his very efficient post office and in the process invents a bird language based on the fact that birds leave various marks and signs and symbols for each other, and he said, well, if I can compile all of these signs and symbols that birds leave each other, then I could create a series of scribbles that form a complete language, written language for the birds, and which he promptly does. Um, anyway, so the doctor sets up his post office, and the bulk of this book is basically his various adventures related to running the post office, to dealing with packages gone astray, and various other things. But at the very end of the book, what pulls him away is word reaches him from an ancient turtle, herein pictured. Uh, this ancient turtle is so old that he was there for Noah's flood. Uh, I am not going to dispute the issue of how old people believe the world to be at any given time, but anyways, this is a turtle that is clearly thousands upon thousands of years old, and so Dr. Doolittle is extremely eager to meet this turtle because he wants to, you know, talk to somebody who was there thousands and thousands of years ago who can give him first-hand accounts of civilizations and people and events that happened that long ago, as anyone with an interest, with a serious interest in history might want. You know, I can see any number of historians leaping at the opportunity to talk to a first-person source from, you know, literally thousands of years ago who could answer their questions. So he goes and he makes his way through the swamps to this turtle who is described as being enormous. Um, you know, he's described as having a, a shell that is 12 feet across, which is a very, very large turtle. If you are not somebody who works in Imperial, um, who thinks in Imperial, that's probably roughly... Ooh. Uh, maybe three and a half meters? give or take, because, uh, you know, that's a yard is three feet, and a yard is slightly less than a meter, so, you know, it's four yards, so it's slightly less than four yards, so three, we'll call it three and a half meters, um, because I could probably do the conversion, but that's more work than I want to go to. Um... <laughs> Also, because I don't offhandedly know what the difference is, and that would mean I would have to convert centimeters into inches and then calculate everything back round, and that's, that would take me way longer than I want to. Anyways, <laughs> I can, I just don't feel like it. Anyways, so I love this picture, though. I love this turtle silhouette and these, just this stylized mangrove tree there cutting through it. It's just... I love these pictures. They're really, really, like, like there, there's just some really, really nice illustration in this book. Anyway, so he talks to the turtle, and after talking to the turtle, he basically decides he's had enough. Um, and indeed, when he gets back to the African kingdom where he had been running his post office, it turns out that a bunch of international ships have started docking there, and he's able to say, well, now that you have regular human ships, uh, you know, you don't need me to run your international mail because you will have people coming in and out of your port who will be able to take letters for you. So I am going to pack up because it's not like you can run the bird post office if you can't talk to birds. Uh, so he packed up and, and headed home. And uh, yeah, this is a fun book. It's really, really fun. Uh, but Dr. Doolittle is generally fun. Anyways, uh, that's all I have to say, and I will see you all next week.